the Warhammer video is doing much better than I expected it to, so thank you very much guys. If you haven't already, make sure to like and sub because those things are super important for a small channel like ours. So after an entire episode of Nothing But Humans, we can now talk about chaos, which Finally. involves humans again. But a little what? bit less, we also got demons and shit. <laughs> I mean, I guess there are bad humans as well. Or maybe it's more like the humans who were corrupted by the warp. So, as I've mentioned many times before, we've discussed the warp. The immaterium, the hellish landscape, the mm -hmm. purgatory dimension realm between the material realm of our existence. Now, in the warp, it's terrifying, horrible, there are demons everywhere, things are crazy, uh -huh. all your minds and thoughts and emotions get projected there. It is both formless and empty, it is vast and tiny, it uh, obeys the laws of time and physics while simultaneously does absolutely nothing of the sort it is a hodgepodge and a culmination of just unknowable eldritch horrifying shit and there are four gods that permeate in chaos and the warp these are the four major chaos gods and if we wish to learn about chaos we need to learn about each and every single one of these chaos gods first up we have corn and he is the easiest corn <laughs> is your classic satan he is all about anger, murder, fighting, blood, guts, death. You ever heard the term blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne? Oh, okay. So that that's where this is from. Yeah, I have heard this before. I think it was, what, in an Angry Joe video? <laughs> I, I might have peeped one of his uh, Warhammer reviews or something. The whole idea is that he is all about the fury and strength of battle. He doesn't care where blood comes from so long as blood is flowing. He wants to fight and murder and carnage and slaughter and death, 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 death. That is corn. Very simple cool. to understand. Next up you have Zeech and Zeech is the god. Zeech? That's how you say that name? I mean, I don't know how else he would say that name. <laughs> of change. However, the god of change, it permeates in so many different other ways. Wait, does he have a mouth on his he does. Okay. Most eldritch of all the demon gods. He has this weird way to always be plucking at the strings of the universe. He's always conniving and scheming and doing his best to cause as much gotcha. little bullshit as he can. Zeech is, is unknowable. Everything that makes sense, he will and won't do. Every future and setting and every type of, of destiny or fate is all foretold and also changeable. It is set in stone while also completely random. He knows what everything is going to happen and also that none of it's going to happen. You would ask Zeech a question. That question leads to three more questions. And those questions lead to the heat death of the universe, which asks four <laughs> answers to those questions. And then uh -huh. he thinks to himself, what are questions even really? And are you even asking the questions or are you simply giving paths to answers and, and other horse shit. Zeech is just, <laughs> I'm gonna fuck with stuff. He is yes and he is no. He is the understanding and he is complexity. He is unknowable. And that's what the God of Change is about. Very bizarre. And he likes birds a lot. I don't, I don't know why. Next up we go. Okay, well, I know somebody in our group is not gonna like him. Zeech seems like somebody who is 14 and very deep. <laughs> Next up, we got Papa Nurgle. Papa Nurgle, he loves- Ah, Nurgle. Okay, I think I remember somebody leaving a comment about Nurgle, and I was like, you know, I'll accept his embrace if he's thick. And oh boy, this man is very thick. <laughs> Papa Nurgle, he loves you for who you are. Probably not. He will murder you just the same. But Papa Nurgle mm. is about rot pestilence, death, and decay. He is the end okay. of everything. Him and Zeech do not like each other very much because where Zeech represents change and adjustment, Nurgle represents stagnation and death. He is all about miasma and pestilence and large bloat and pus and, and organs and people just being sedentary, sloth. He is the idea that everything will rot and decay and die. Nothing is certain besides decay and death. All of us will end up the same way and broken down through just sheer never-ending decomposition. 
So the joke that Nurgle always loves you is generally because of that, because we all end up the same. We all rot and we all die and wither. That's Nurgle, and uh, he's got okay. a general theme of, of course, pestilence and and different kinds of diseases and sickness and things of that nature. That's generally Nurgle. He's pretty easy to understand as well, and he's he, he chunk. Finally, we. <laughs> Now I'm starting to understand uh, the comment section a little bit. And, uh, well, this was a wonderful frame to pause on. <laughs> Bricky also has censor. You know what? I'm going to censor myself, too. How about that? Youngest of the Chaos Gods, and that is Slanesh, also known as the Slanesh. Prince of Pleasure or the God of Unspeakable Excess. Slanesh is generally referred to with sex. But it's not only sex, it's just that's a good avenue if you want to make stuff. Sonesh is just the idea of the senses of the body being cranked to not just 11, but more like 17. See, we'll discuss Sonesh a little bit more when we talk about the Eldar, because mm. they done fucked up. But she... Eldar. He... It, it. Or whatever, is mainly about just the excess of emotions. And therefore, sex is generally a large part of it. However, it's mostly pain and torture lots of pain torture but sometimes um i i remember making a comment about being like uh kind of interested in slanesh initially in the part one video because we did see an image of the four demons here but uh i'm not really into this <laughs> like i'm not gonna king shame anybody but uh i uh i'm not this far gone thankfully Sometimes sexually related or drug related. Lots of drugs. Lots of drugs. Slanesh gets off on everything. Extremes in happiness, extremes in sadness, extremes in pain and sadism and masochism. And of course that goes along with the sex part of it as well. It's generally mm -hmm. referred to with sex because of the color scheme. Very purple, lots of exposed genitalia. A lot of their models have like exposed nipples and stuff. And that is generally the theme you go for from a physical side, but it really embodies everything, mainly pain and and also the, the excessive amounts of emotion. So when it comes down to it, you'll find a lot of them have things like spikes or whips or any kind of BDSM style gear because <laughs> it is unspeakable excess, the prince of pleasure. Everything in excess to the point where it is just sheer frightening. That is Slanesh in a nutshell. A little bit bizarre and a little hard to describe sometimes, but as we talk more about the Dark Eldar later in this video, you'll understand it far, far better. I actually wouldn't mind like playing as them in uh, some sort of RTS game. I think there are like Total War Warhammer games out there, but like <laughs> my computer is a 1050 Ti. Um, yeah, no, we're not running that. <laughs> they might be thinking, why would anyone ever want to join Chaos? They all look horrifying, screwed up, and just frightening things, right? Well, the thing is, is that, of it's course, cool. one, your mind is put into the warp and the materium, so you can be easily swayed by chaos demons when you get into your head, yeah. especially if you're a psyker. Sometimes regiments of the less mentally strong people, whether they be civilians or, say, low-level guardsmen or conscripts, can be easily swayed by this and become chaos cultists and stuff, and they serve their dark gods and whatever god they personally refer. However, and this might seem strange, chaos in their own right isn't necessarily evil. See, the warp is every manifestation of emotion and being, every soul, every thing of existence. This includes all the good things. All the different chaos gods have another side to their coin. Korn might be oh. death, murder, slaughter, slaughter, but he's also got this weird sense of survival of the fittest, trial by combat, and honor. Korn will never lie to you. Corn will never stab you in the back. Corn isn't about conniving and scheming. Corn is about straight up mono e mono, you versus me, get in the ring, we're gonna murder each other hard right now. It may not be a good thing at the end of the day, but it is that other side of the coin. I appreciate it when there are beings that are, you know, on the surface evil, but really they have this other side to them where you can kind of appreciate their presence within the universe because a lot of the time in stories when something is just straight up black and white it it becomes very stale and boring very easily but in a universe where everybody's basically the villain you have to have something that you could kind of rally behind uh, when it comes to their ideals and i'm just glad that they were able to find something that these like 
evil demons are actually good for. Him and Zeke generally don't get along because Zeke is that conniving schemer, but he's mm. also about the idea of hope. Where there is change, there is change for your predicament. There is change for your problem. The hope of the galaxy, the ability to bend the world to your will, the idea that your fate is not set in stone, but in reality that you control your own destiny and can control it whenever you want. The changer mm. of ways. That is Zeech. I don't think Monokuma would like Zeech very much. And of course, Zeech and Nurgle hate each other because while Nurgle does represent stagnation, death, and decay, he also represents finality and ending. The fact that you can be mentally at peace knowing that you will end and how you will end. Fear of the unknown, fear of change is not present with Nurgle. With Nurgle, everything will rot and die, mm -hmm. and that provides that finality, that ability that this is over. We are all the same, and we will all end the same. We know the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to live and die and rot. And with that, it brings peace of mind. It's kind of odd, but true, certainly. Knowing that no matter what problems arise in your life, that at the end of the day, it's really nothing in the grand scheme of things. That we all meet a, our inevitable doom someday, so that gives us the courage to live every single day to our fullest. That's nice. But, uh, Nurgle, not very nice. <laughs> Slaanesh is a lot more simple. While they are the excess of emotion, they are also the representation of emotion. Slaanesh embodies happiness. Slash embodies excitement and joy and pleasure, not only in the sense of the physical, you know, BAM <laughs> style of pleasure, but also everything else like food and drink and uh, air on your cheek and sunlight, the feeling, emotion and feeling. Mm. All of that is also represented with Slanesh. So you have to ask- I see. So appreciating uh, life in and of itself. Just every single sense and emotion, living life to its fullest in a way. Kind of odd, but yeah, I, I can see the reasoning behind these. Why are they always represented as super evil skulls and spikes on everything and want to murder everybody? I don't really got an answer for you on that one. My assumption is that <laughs> because mentally humans may think worse thoughts, even if we don't act on them, and therefore they're projected in the warp more. That one's a little bit weird. I don't know. This is me spitballing right now, but... I mean, when it comes to the warp and how we've kind of established this concept of it, you can't really logic anything when logic makes no sense anymore in the warp, so... It just is what it is. I don't know. You need a, you need a super bad guy. You already got the Imperium of Man. You need somebody to be a little bit worse than them. So you got to do this. <laughs> Honestly, who cares? I just want to buy like a bird magician. Look at him. So Dude, that looks kind of cool. Not gonna lie. Look at the detail on that sculpture. I mean, what would you call it? A figure? I think a figure. So combining all this together on the tabletop, chaos demons are generally very melee based. They run in, go really hard. You have lots of summoning and conjuring, tons of spells. Generally a little bit frail, but they have special saves to make them a little bit stronger. You've got giant demons mm. and smaller demons. You got hordes of little boys and tons of big guys. Oh, dude, that looks so cool. Generally speaking, I'm the kind of person who, when I play video games, I either play the hot, sexy lady, or I go, like, full feral demon. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of, it's doing something for me. Demons are, as they seem, demons. Nurgle is slow, uh, Korn is super scary in melee, you've got Zeech who are far more into psychers and spellcasting, and then Slanesh who is all melee, really 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 fast but squishy, but in lots of hordes mm. and tons of melee and, and pain damage. I mean, they're not very much so armor, overall, so yeah. Overall, the demons are a huge part of 40k and a massive threat to almost every single faction with a, the exception of a couple. However, the big part about demons is also transferred into the other Exception nine primarchs we didn't talk about, which are the Chaos Space Marines. Ooh, so this is what happens when you fall to the dark side. So Horse and all of his boys, all of them in the primarchs, they have all also become Chaos Boys, and they all have their own special Chaos Legions, specializing okay. in so many different things, just like the Adeptus Astartes, the Angels of Death, 
the regular Space Marines. Chaos Space Marines aren't a whole lot different than the regular Space Marines. They have the same armor, you know, the same training and toughness. They just specialize in different kinds of things. And also a lot of their Primarchs have ascended into greater de- Is it greater <laughs> demons? They're demon Primarchs at this point. Gigantic, horrifying man-demon hybrids that are pretty awesome, if I'm going to be honest. They look really- yeah, I have to agree. Like, the Space Marine armor and stuff just looks really cool, but when you evilify it, <laughs> it just makes it even more badass. But them and their associated legions that they are a part of are all kind of going out there and causing a large ruckus for everyone else. Considering the raw strength and firepower of a legion of Space Marines, imagine that entire legion just converting to chaos and immediately fighting you. It's generally pretty horrifying. There's a lot of them, so I gotta write them down, but you've got the Emperor's Children with Primarch Fulgrim, loyal to Slanesh. These hmm. people, they are some messed up people. They're just sensory overload, Aye. tons of drugs, tons of torture, and I think Fulgrim is a demon Primarch right now, and oh god, I am terrified to see what that man looks like. At least it looks like a top, demon right? from SMT. Emperor's children are not good people. You've got the Iron Warriors, which are kind of like opposite of the Imperial Fists with Primarch Perturabo, I believe is his name. They're Chaos Undivided. They just kind of serve Chaos in a general aspect instead of choosing one of the four. But the Iron Warriors are big on the siege and fortification, and they're basically entirely against the Imperial Fists and a major rival. Perturabo, I believe, is also still alive, and I'm also very interested to see what he looks like because... Demon Primarchs are badass. You've got the Night Lords with Primarch Conrad Kurz. Conrad Kurz is dead, which is good because he's a sick fuck. But the Night Lords <laughs> are generally about terror, terrorizing people and terrorism. They're generally about fear and rightly so. You've got the World Eaters with Primarch Ooh. Angron still alive. Also excited to see. Angron, if you think you've known an angry person, Angron is the angriest son of a bitch you will ever know. <laughs> Angron I mean, it's in his name. Angron removed parts of his brain that didn't make him angry, so he could be angrier. Bruh. Angron. Fuckers Are mad. you kidding me? You've got the Death Guard with Primarch Mortarian. They actually have their own special codex and their own major army on the tabletop. Mortarian himself is actually one of the models, and, and look at him. Look at him. It's so cool looking. Of course, Nurgle based, obviously. So very mm, slow, yeah. but very tanky. You've got the word bearers with Primarch Lorgar. Lorgar is, I believe, still alive. I don't know what's up with him at the current moment, but the word bearers are generally the people who caused all the major problems in the beginning. At least I blame them for it. They're little assholes. <laughs> you get the Black Legion with Primarch Horus. These guys look really cool. You've got the Alpha Legion with Primarch Alpharius Omegon. Chaos, I think. And then finally, you've got the Thousand Sons with Primarch Magnus the Nerd. Uh, the Thousand Sons also have their own book, Just Like the Death Guard. Magnus is also a tabletop model. He looks super cool, Ooh. as you can tell. And they're all super heavily Psyker and kind of Egyptian themed. They look pretty neat. But overall, with all of these Chaos Space Marine factions, you can play as a lot, of, a lot of different ones, but the main ones that you can really work at are standard Space Marines, Chaos Space Marines, as well as the Death Guard and Thousand Suns, as they are the most fleshed out, especially on the tabletop, at least. See, this right here, this is a really good way to describe the Chaos Space Marines. What the thick-headed fools with their broken corpse of an emperor fail to understand is that not only can they never defeat us, but they cannot hide or flee or shield themselves from the triumph of chaos. They are finite and we are unbound, undivided. They must not err or they shall fall to heresy. All who fall join our cause. Every imperial fool who dares to open his eyes is a willing recruit. They strive merely to hold back our fury and might, and it consumes them. Thus, you can see chaos is inevitable. We lurk not only beyond their grasp and at their gates, we lurk within the darkness of their souls, on the tip of their tongues, in their tortured dreams. We are them, but freed from the shackles of ignorance. We are them, grown strong, evolved. We are them, but so much more. I think I stated this in the previous video, but those just small paragraphs, I really, really like their writing style. Hardcore as that quote is, the saddest part is they're mostly right. Chaos is basically unkillable. 
you could probably get rid of Space Marines a decent amount, the Chaos Space Marines, mm -hmm. that is. But every soul that dies goes to the warp. Every Chaos soul will end up back in the warp. And depending on how hard you killed them, they will come back at some point. Every demon you banish will return at some point. Chaos is unstoppable. The warp is unending. And while maybe there is at some point some way to stop them somehow, the eh, resources so. to do so, the requirements to do so, are so far beyond the reaches of man and the other races at the current moment that really it's just an unstoppable force that just keeps on coming. They certainly live up to their name of chaos. At this point, it's a natural force within reality itself. As long as reality exists, I don't think chaos will ever leave. Which is also a perfect scenario for such a grim world that's always gonna constantly be stuck at war. Thank goodness that we don't live in the Warhammer universe. Chaos is by far the biggest threat. They are without number, their legions are everywhere, and yeah, they're pretty scary. So, I promise, we're done with humans now. Let's talk about some Xenos. The Eldar, who are these? So let's talk about the Eldar, or also known as the Eldari, which are a super hyper-specialized and very technologically advanced race of, well, elf people. They were, as well, Elf responsible people? for the creation of Slanesh, the newest what? demon god. How'd they do that? They created a... What? <laughs> I thought those were just beings who, who came into existence because of the existence of the universe itself. Like, representations of chaos. I... Huh? <laughs> Debauchery on a world-ending scale. See, back in the day, it was just huh? Horns, Each, and Nurgle. It just, <laughs> was it like the biggest orgy ever or something? What are we talking about here? And the Eldar okay. are very, very ancient. Millions of years. These Eldar, however, have a bit of a sensory problem. You know, every kind of pain or feeling that you have is a little bit amplified compared to the normal. However, with Eldar, oh. as their race advanced so excessively, and they became so re self-reliant, and everything became so easy, there was no requirement for food production anymore, there was no shortages, everything was basically done. Everyone was so comfortable, oh. and that comfort breeded this weird sedation. Boredom. And that sedation breeded the requirement for more and more debauchery. Deb debauchery! Debauchery! <laughs> when everything you have can be so easily acquired, you will end up down this road of pure debauchery. All of the senses the Eldar had that were so powerful, things like feeling, happiness, sadness, and just evil and good, all needed to be satisfied and satiated. And the desire to satiate these senses grew more and more with worse and worse debauchery. It started off with things like sex and drugs becoming so much more rampant because of these are the first things you generally turn to when requirements for living are so easily accessible. It would get to the point that made Sander Cohen in Bioshock look sane. All right, this is the kind of debauchery it led to. It was constantly satisfying and satiating these sexual and sadistic or masochistic fantasies that only elevated and elevated, and this was species-wide. People started going down darker, more depraved, and more violent paths as time went on. However, some people didn't entirely take to that. Some of the Eldar were looking at this depraved okay. species that they had become I mean, and good. said, I, no <laughs> thanks for me, dog, I'm good. And they bailed. These are the craft world Eldar. They left on these giant continent-sized starships called craft worlds. They believed in learning the old ways of the Eldar and pushing away from this depravity and debauchery and going back to their main roots. And so they would segment themselves on these giant craft worlds far in the outer reaches of space. They even had this thing called the Webway. Remember what we mentioned about warp travel with the Imperium? Yeah. Well, the Eldar had something way safer called a Webway. And the Eldar Webway is actually like a pocket dimension kind of thing. And in that pocket dimension, there were also more horrible, depraved groups and clans that would spend their time in there. And if you imagine the debauchery was bad already, these were debauchery X10. So all of this continued, and it continued, mm. and it bloated. Until 
Slanesh just came into being. Forth. All that emotion, all that mental, well, thought processes, I suppose, all of this in such a condensed space. Don't forget, this is all being shot, all their souls as well, into the warp. All this depravity right into the warp. So what happened? Boom! Slanesh was birthed and killed off 90% of the entire Eldar population. Untold trillions. Tr Yikes, bro. <laughs> That's an oof for me, dog. <laughs> it does make sense, right? If they were truly as advanced as, like, not having to do anything anymore in order to survive or fulfill any sort of need, then obviously when you're in that kind of state, you... You want to seek out something, anything, so that you feel alive. But man, that's kind of scary to think about. We're constantly trying to push technology forward, but if we ever reach that point, then is that just the collapse of civilization as we know it? But then, like, stopping the advancement of technology also isn't really the solution, is it? Hmm. Had their souls ripped from their bodies and their actual fleshy bodies devoured by Slanesh demons. The entirety of the Eldar race was eaten alive and their souls consumed to the Prince of Pleasure. All of them got fucked up. It was so bad that it literally ripped a warp hole into the fabric of the materium called the Eye of Terror. That's literally this like quasi horrifying gateway portal from the materium and the immaterium right next to Cadia. <laughs> <laughs> and it is horrifying. So this I that Slanesh, from the first also video. known as She Who Thirsts by the Eldar, <laughs> slaughtered the entire population except for a couple. Those in the craft worlds were actually not affected by this as they were so far in the reaches of the galaxy. That crazy crack, that birth of Sonesh only affected the ones in the center. So these craft world Eldar were able to escape, but Sonesh got their sights on them. Every time an Eldar will die, their soul doesn't just pass into the warp naturally. It goes straight to Slanesh, craft world or not. What about those people in the webway? Well, imagine that giant birth happening, but they were only able to just barely get a grasp onto you. Slanesh was just barely able to hold on. These people are the Dark Eldar, or also known as the Jukari. The Eldar population right now is so massively small. It is minuscule compared to any of the other pop- well, most of the other populations in the- I mean, it makes sense. A literal chaos god came forth and destroyed your entire race, so, yeah. The Eldar are consistently having issues trying to get their population up because as their souls are constantly being hungered by from Sonesh, they realize their entire species is doomed. And they understand it very well. Since the time of the fall, our race has been haunted by what we, in our reckless pursuit of hedonistic indulgence, gave birth to. Though our dreams once overturned worlds and quenched suns, we are now but fitful shadows clinging to the edge of existence. All the stars in the sky cannot blot out the hateful glare of the red moon's eye. The birthing place of the great enemy pulses with all the malice of a demon that is dreaming, casting its shadow over all we have ever done and all we ever shall. Every twisted strand of fate and casting of the runes leads me to this time, to this place, Place, and it is clear that the final battle awaits me at the ancient crone worlds. A conflict the likes of which has not been seen since the Monkai warred amongst themselves and their corpse of a seer fell to his traitorous son is coming and all my steps lead towards it no matter that I walk other paths. I see the stars stain red with the blood of the Monkai and though their wars do not concern me, I would gladly let them destroy one another. I know that to avoid this fight is to condemn my race to inevitable doom and though all I see is darkness, I know that I will not flinch from my destiny. And now let's talk about cute plastic models. Bro, I'm straight up not having a good time. <laughs> the first playable race we have for the Eldar are the craft world Eldar and living in those craft world starships I mentioned earlier. And okay. each of them have their own kind of craft world, almost like a space marine legion. Each craft world is its, in itself its own special kind of group. And the Eldar themselves are very 
fast and rely a lot on trickery. They are squishy, a bit weak, but they're very in tune as psychers. Tons of psychers across the entire Eldar population. Gotcha. And their weaponry and abilities are fast and extremely hard hitting, but of course rather fragile. Understanding an Eldar brain is, a glass cannon. is an exercise in futility. They are all over the place in confusion and trickery on a whole galactic scale. They fight weird, they think weirder, and Eldar in their own right really rely on this to keep their species alive. They need to think about deception and the strangeness of what they do if they truly want to not- Well, they don't exactly have the numbers, so it makes so much sense. ...be immediately murdered and slaughtered wholesale thanks to their entirely small population. However, I must say that it seems like their population is getting slightly better. These crap worlds hold millions upon millions of people. And as they continually, you know, reproduce and have their crap worlds expand, losing a few people in battle, while hurts a lot, they aren't really losing what's extremely precious to them. It's not like every single death means the death of their species. It seems like they're kind of on the upturn a little bit. They're still a doom okay. race being sucked into Slaanesh every time someone dies, but yeah. they are definitely doing a little bit better than they were before. Eldar are fast, cunning, and what they don't make up for in tankiness, they make up for in extremely advanced weaponry. They also call humans Monkai, which is something I mentioned earlier. Um, ah. That is a derogatory slur for humans in the oh. Warhammer world. Um, why see. is it called Monkai? Well, it's because you can't, in your game, call people monkeys. <laughs> I was about to say, that sounds a lot like monkey. <laughs> On the tabletop, exactly what I said. Not very tanky, generally pretty squishy, hit like trucks, and move at Mach 5. Fast, hit hard, die fast. Exactly how it sounds. They've been good for a very long time, too. We bring only mm. death and leave only carry-on. It is a message even a human can understand. <laughs> well, damn. Really looking down on humans here. I see. Eldar. So, Drukhari. Let's talk about the Dark Eldar. On today's episode of how fucked up is fucked up. <laughs> so those people yeah. I mentioned in the webway, in the super deranged cults and the depraved people of the Eldar, in the webway they didn't quite get a hold onto them. So Nash like has them, but it has them on like by the pinky finger. And they're slowly being consumed by Slanesh, but they found out they can stave her off by doing Slanesh things. The Dark Eldar are by far the worst, most horrifying, disgusting, depraved, and brutal race in all of Warhammer 40k. These are okay. entirely a group of people whose full purpose to save their species from extinction, to go into planets, raid them, and take as many slaves as they possibly can to torture them for one, five, ten, twenty, a million years because that torture will keep them from dying. They look very BDSM style too. They definitely have a lot more spiky bits and they have a lot more of that kind of leathery black look to them. But let's, example, let's say you are an upstanding Imperial citizen living life on a regular planet. Uh -oh. You get invaded by the Necrons. The Necrons will shoot you with a deatomizer and you will be destroyed in a millisecond and <laughs> that's it. Not the worst way to go. Uh, you are yeah. invaded by Chaos Marines or something. You take a yeah. bolter shot to the head or a chain Die. sword across your stomach and uh -huh. you get cut in half. Painful, but not the worst. You die. Uh, the orcs yeah. arrive. They beat you to death. Hurts, but, you know, whatever. Tyranids, they eat you alive. It's pretty rough. Yeah. The mm -hmm. Dark Eldar. The Dark Eldar. Uh, this is going to get a little graphic. I apologize. Ooh. You pray you die. You don't. You are instead taken as a human slave. Your life will be endless work and agony, 24-7. They will make sure you can't not die, as your pain satisfies them. They will hook you up to all manner of torture devices. They will inject pain-based, like, stimuli drugs directly into your nervous system. They will slowly run razor blades across your skin. They will uh... and pull out your teeth 
and your fingernails one by one. They will remove your appendages and your skin and wait for it to grow back so they can do it again. They will murder and torture and use the R word that rhymes with grape your entire family in front of you and do the exact same thing to them. You yourself will also be rhymes with grape anywhere and everywhere <laughs> possible. And this will occur for 20 years oh, until you are no longer satisfying no, to them. And dude. then you will be contorted, crushed, and twisted into some form of trophy. A fleshy trophy or a ring or a couch or a TV stand or perhaps a wonderful hat while you are, of course, still alive and breathing. And you will become a moaning fleshy trophy for eternity wow <laughs> that's a. Uh... let's just die <laughs> whoa dude hell no oh god ah i can't i feel so sorry for anybody who gets captured by them the amount of like pain and suffering and the things that they do to you kind of reminds me of a short story called uh, what was it again? I think it was it was called uh, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. I highly recommend checking it out because it's pretty good with a lot of sci-fi horror being based on it or rather inspired by it. But like, damn, dude, <laughs> I'd rather face anything else that Bricky mentioned beforehand in battle than uh, than these guys. And that is what happens when you are taken by the Dark Eldar. They are the most depraved, most horrifying race in all of 40k. They look the part, and they do it so they all don't die. They are literally forced to do this, because if they don't, Slaanesh's grip will get harder, and they will have their <laughs> souls pulled away. So long as they keep doing this, Slaanesh is like, you're doing good, man. You're doing solid. You keep, you keep that shit up, you elf-eared bastards. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the Dark Eldar. That's the Drakari. Okay, I I see. Giving justification to such horrendous acts and making it make sense is is a nice touch. They are horrible. On the tabletop, they're actually kind of like Eldar, but more extreme. They are even squishier than the Eldar, but they hit generally even harder. Fast attacks, skirmishers, really quick, speedy, like get around them, do a lot of damage, get away kind of stuff. That's the most of the Dark Eldar. Mm. Look at the definition of grim dark in a dictionary. You'll find a picture of the Dark Eldar and Sev from Republic Commando. A quote <laughs> from uh, Mr. Vect. We are the lords of despair, masters of terror, dread and agony are our meat and wine, and they are plentiful indeed. Yum. Dark Eldar. Let's talk about the Harlequins. Clowns. What's the matter, Andy? Wait, literally? Don't you have some fun? The Harlequins are a bizarre race of Eldar. They're demonic clown performers. They're like a weird mix of Sander Cohen from Bioshock and Jin from League of Legends, but in a more clown theme. Uh -huh. they're, they're artists of death and perfectors of their craft. They do not belong to craft worlds or any of the weird Drukhari people. They guard something called the Black Library, which is this giant tome of never-ending knowledge deep in the heart of the Eldar webway, and also guarded by their god named Kegarok, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Kegarok? He is the laughing god, but it's the Eldar's laughing, laughing god? god? What? And these are the Harlequins, the Harlequin clowns. These are Eldar clowns, okay? So imagine the things that an Eldar these depraved individuals would find funny. Yeah. And this is the mm. god of that. It's it's a horror clown. These are gods mm. of horror yeah. for us normal people. For them, they're like, oh, ho, ho, it's so funny. They're all dying horribly. <laughs> honk, honk, honk. <laughs> they're very bizarre and difficult to describe. Uh, they've escaped the ruinous powers of Slaanesh somehow, but their main thing is guarding that cool. black library. And the Harlequins just... They're demon clown performers. They're barely any models on the tabletop. They're good in melee. They're they're demon clowns. I I'm not sure. I, I got a quote. It is. I mean, <laughs> I honestly wasn't expecting something like this in the Warhammer universe. But I guess I should really consider everything as a possibility with how the warp works and just honestly how this entire universe works. 
It's too easy for an Eldar to embrace the obscene virtues of chaos, for Slaanesh is nothing more than a manifestation of the Eldar mind in its most wild and unconstrained form. Human morality is meaningless to the Eldar, and to the dark side of the Eldar mind, all life is to be expended at a whim. Cruelty and generosity are but the impulse of a moment. Beauty and sensuality are virtues that can be expressed in bloodshed just as easily as in song. Hmm. To an unfettered Eldar mind, there is that. neither sanity nor madness, but merely a wave of perfect existence fulfilled by its own savage momentum. They're very strange. Harlequins, Drukhari, yeah. Eldar, they are an anomaly that make humans seem completely easy to understand in comparison. Uh -huh. They range from rekindling their civilization to horrifying murder and also clowns. They are all over the place, but honestly, they represent quite well and are rather interesting, especially with the whole Sonesh murdering everyone bit. So, yeah, Eldar. Now, cool. bugs. Ma, they following me, Ma. Tyranids. They following me. Who, who following you? The, the bugs. The bugs. <laughs> the Tyranids. <laughs> Now, you want to talk something a lot more fun, a little more simple than all this crazy Eldar shenanigans? Let's talk the Tyranids. They're bugs. Do they look like Zerg? Hell yeah, they look like Zerg. You want to know why they look like Zerg? Because they were actually supposed to uh, be what Zerg were. Uh, apparently Starcraft what? was supposed to be a 40k game in the beginning. Hence why they look oh. so much like Eldar, Zerg, and the Imperium of Man. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, you learn something new every day. Kind of space marine -y, those marines, huh? They look a little bit space marine yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, they, they really do. I don't know. You really fucked up on that one, Games Workshop, didn't ya? Tyranids are a giant infestation of unfathomable proportions. These are giant, extremely bio-advanced hive mind organisms that are basically oh, all about absorbing as much biomass as they possibly can to evolve and mutate to be extremely potent and powerful and kill and eat anything in their path. They are Damn. probably the least evil faction in all of 40k because all they want to do is eat shit. They want to om nom nom the entire galaxy. They I mean, yeah, they're the least evil because it's just, you know, they, they just need sustenance and they're just acting towards their nature. This is uh, kind of reminding me of the flesh that hates from the SCP universe. Hangry and we food. Also, this Tyranid hive mind has a presence in the warp. In fact, Tyranids in their own right have a massive presence in the warp. They have a thing called the shadow in the warp specifically, where when they are coming in to invade a planet, Ooh. they have this weird ability to kind of cut off the warp on all the psychers on that planet. Oh. And how do you get help across the stars? Well, you need the warp because you yeah, need that yeah. interstellar travel. So they're just so cut off from help? unable to call for help from the Tyranids, these are just easy pickings. And an entire giant Tyranid high fleet comes out of orbit and just will massacre. That's so absorbing scary. all that biomass and turning them and all of their other Tyranids into even more advanced monsters. They come in so many varieties too, all in based on what is important. Tiny little ripper swarms for s scouting and having little dudes eat people up, to the Hormagons, Termagons, and Gene Stealers, all the way to the Hive Guard and the Exocrines and the Swarm Lord, to Hive Tyrants and their giant battle fleets, and even something as crazy as the Hierophant Bio Titan. Ooh. The Tyranids come in all forms and sizes depending on what they require. They are extremely good at anti-biological weaponry. There is no way you can plague them or blight them. They have extremely strong armor, uh, carapaces and such. Tyranids are, are nigh-perfect organisms and are pretty spooky when it comes down to how they handle all of their genetic material. Keep feeding them, they'll keep evolving. They keep on creating new horrifying organisms to spread across the galaxy. And you know what the most terrifying part of the Tyranids is? We might be surrounded. There have been like around six or seven mm -hmm. Tyranid Hive fleets. Behemoth, Kronos, all these different kinds of Hive fleets. And they've all arrived in the galaxy from different points. Different sections of the Milky Way galaxy have had different Tyranids oh. come through. And that is horrible. So what that means is that literally everything outside of the Milky Way galaxy is just... Tyranids?
At least that, that's what that would suggest, right? Horrifying. Because as far as we know, we could just be surrounded on all sides by Tyranids. The only reason you may not Damn. hear a whole lot about Tyranids is because it's a little bit hard to have a bunch of story off of one Insects. hive mind genocidal yeah. monsters. All these giant bugs swarming in, killing and eating everybody and evolving. I would assume that they would just play the role of the quote unquote bad guys and get beat up by a bunch of space marines and then just fall back or something. Well, I mean, as cool as there are there's some cool characters, the Swarm Lord, Old One-Eye, you can't really have a whole bunch of major character-based stories around them. As awesome as they are, they're simple. They want to eat you. They want to eat you and absorb your biomass. They are simple bugs. If you want something a little more complex, talk Gene Stealer cults. I can have all the pot I want, I get around faster than walking, and wherever I need a seat, I can just sit on my balls. Gene Stealer cults are a special Excuse brand me? of Tyranid <laughs> that can slowly infect themselves into different kinds of society. And by infecting uh... them, they can rise up to where they all pray and believe in these re like regular humans, pray and believe into their Tyranid hive mind gods. And these brood lords and I think they're called patriarchs, all can turn an entire world all based into gene stealers and these are called gene stealer cults an entire okay. high world of the imperium can be turned into nothing but servants of the tyranny masters i'm assuming that this is one of those situations where maybe it would be a good idea to destroy the planet if literally everybody has been infected <laughs> It might just be more cost efficient than trying to go down and clear out everything. Or maybe not. Maybe we really just save that for, like, when the demons of chaos just completely consume a world. Just by infecting them and screwing with their genetic code a little bit. They also have this cool, like, Mad Max look, which is really neat. They are definitely one of the bigger threats to the Imperium besides chaos. I, I keep saying biggest threat to the Imperium. They're up there, though, because you, Dingus, stepped on a bug in middle school. Asshole. Damn. There is a cancer <laughs> eating at the Imperium. With each decade, it advances deeper, leaving drained, dead worlds in its wake. This horror, this abomination, has thought and purpose that functions on an unimaginable galactic scale. And all we can do is to try to stop the swarms of bioengineer monsters it unleashes upon us by instinct. We have given the horror a name to salvage our fears. We call it the Tyranid Race. But if it is aware of us, it must know us as nothing but prey. Tyranids, mm. they're cool. Yeah. But are they as cool as the orcs? Every spring's okay, gone red. here we go. That means I'm super fast. Orcs, 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 orcs. I fucking love orcs. So, yes, the, the green monsters, the green tide, the green skins. These orcs, they are in fact a race in 40k. The orcs mm -hmm. are as exactly what you expect them. They have archaic weapons, they're big boys, they have axes, and they have got big old teeth and they want to kill everything, and there are so many of them. The only reason they haven't taken over the entire galaxy is they can't, can't stop murdering each other. Orcs are so <laughs> cool. Orcs don't have philosophy. Orcs don't have existential crisis. What matters is who's the biggest orc. You listen to that guy, because he the biggest orc. He big orc, big orc <laughs> knows best. You. This is a society I can get behind. <laughs> Very simple. None of that weird BS of like power struggles. Just big orc leader. <laughs> of all the races I have battled throughout the galaxy, the orc is the hardest to comprehend. They wage war with machines that should not work, care little for strategic gains, and are just as likely to slaughter each other as the enemy. How does one battle an enemy that defies all logic? <laughs> as an orc, you're, you're enjoying life. You're enjoying the life you're given. Your whole life and job and purpose is to get up and beat each other to death because you can. The biggest orc is the man who understands everything. He is the boss. And orcs have this really weird, like, big, dumb, stereotype British accent, which is what? just hilarious to me. Those are orcs. You're, <laughs> you fight. You like to fight. Your whole purpose is to fight. You wage war because you want to wage war. You got your boss over there and you better listen to the boss because if you don't listen to the boss, the boss will squish you and make you an example for the other orcs. And then you can't fight because orc dead. And orc dead is orc dead can't fight because orc dead. Orcs, 
they scrap together machines out of parts that don't make any sense and because they believe they have the mental imagination yeah, that that is. machine will run it'll run if that machine's out of gas you're driving that machine with your fellow orcs and the biggest orc is behind the wheel and you run out of gas some orc behind you like oh oh zog we're out of gas and the big orc is Just like believe no it, we're not I filled the fucking gas tank up earlier, and all the other orcs are like, "Oh yeah, I, oh well, yeah, you did do that." <laughs> oh god! Oh my! This is so fun. <laughs> orcs are freaking awesome, man. <laughs> imagine, well, <laughs> funny using the words "imagine" here, but like giving a race the power to just imagine things into existence is so goddamn op. But because you gave them to like the simple minded orcs, it actually kind of balances itself out somehow. <laughs> this is this is genius combination. I love it. And then you turn the, the fucking mech back on and it works again. Does it have gas? Probably not. No. But it works. But now it the does. The power of yeah. imagination. They paint things <laughs> red because it makes them think that goes faster. <laughs> They paint things purple <laughs> because it's the sneakiest color. You wanna know why? You ever seen a purple orc? didn't fucking think mm, so. Nope. Orcs are also like ancient as hell. They're back in the Eldari time frame. But that, back then they were called Crooks and they were much larger and scarier and far more intelligent. Now they're just I orcs see. and they're big, dumb and they smack things. But they're pretty spooky. They're not very well armored, but they hit really hard. And it's called the Green Tide because there are so many orcs. There are about as many orcs as there are Tyranids, maybe more. Who knows? But they keep oh. on, you know, murdering each other, so it's not too bad of an issue. Orcs are entirely comic relief. Their stuff is slapped together. That makes no sense. Their vehicles don't work the way they're supposed to, but they work <laughs> because they think it works, because they imagine that it works. Orcs care only about who is the biggest orc, and they will follow the biggest orc. And then if they want to be the biggest orc, they'll challenge the biggest orc. And then when they go and they issue a wa, a wa is just war in orc, they murder everybody and everything in this giant tide of green orcs who are just excited to be hitting something. They don't care that they're hitting Eldar or the Imperium or Tau or anyone in between. They're just so they get to beat shit up. That's orcs. And on the tabletop, they are a total coin flip and they're really fun. I have never met a salty orc player. I have never met someone who <laughs> plays orcs and is ever just a bad guy or that guy. Orc players have this kind of fun to them because when you play them, you are completely submitting yourself to RNG. So here's the thing. <laughs> guardsmen, Imperial Guardsmen, when they shoot, they roll a dice and on a four up, they'll hit their target. Okay. They have a 50% chance. Space Marines, pretty good. Gotcha. They hit on a three or higher because they're well trained. DC check, then yeah. Custodians, they hit on twos because they're just super Ooh. well trained. Orcs, they hit on a five or higher. But <laughs> I see. <laughs> but if they roll a six, they get to make another shot with Ooh. anything from the dinkiest pistol to the biggest rocket launcher. It does. Dude. Oh god, I really like the Grey Knights, but the orcs are kind of, <laughs> they're kind of doing it for me. <laughs> I mean, just style-wise, I'm more the Grey Knights, obviously, but like, goddamn, that sounds like so much fun. Half of their stuff will blow up on a whim. One, <laughs> one of their medics, if you roll a one to heal someone, you fuck up your surgery and you just kill an orc. <laughs> they're so <laughs> wacky and silly. But the thing is, is, if you roll well, you roll high, and you keep rolling high, you are going to crush people. And if Heck you don't, yeah, dude. you lose. I mean, that's the what power you of imagination. That's what happens when you play orc. It's a coin flip. Which is why you can't be a salty bitch when you play orcs, because things won't go your way. It's just the roll of the dice. You're playing a dice game. But if you're going to have fun, and you want to be stupid, and you want to be silly, you're going to play some damn orcs. But on the Heck opposite yeah, side of the fun part of this, let's talk about the Necrons. The not-so-fun part of Sandra. Necrons. The Necrons are spooky, scary skeletons and very grimdark again. 
They have a much more fleshed out lore than before. Back in the day, they were just undead Egyptian space terminators, and they still look that way, but now they actually have a story. <laughs> Egyptian so space way back in the day, you had the Necron tier. Kind of see a theme here, Eldari, Eldar, Krork, yeah. Krork, Necron, Necron tier. So the Necron tier were this race of generally kind of shitty people. Not because they were personally <laughs> shitty, okay. but because their lives were awful. They were ill-fated uh. to a horrible existence of like radiation and a terrible planet they lived on, and everything just really sucked. Being a Necron tier was just really depressing. They really were looking gotcha. for immortality. They were extremely reliant on the hope that they would eventually find the key to living forever and to stave off this horrible nature that they were thrust upon them, and therefore they could become the most dominant race in the galaxy. And they found this group, they're called the Old Ones. Imagine them kind of like the Forerunners in Halo or the Zelnaga in StarCraft, right? These Old Ones were these sp strong, oh, pretty much omnipotent beings. And they, of course, knew the key to immortality. So the Necrons mm. went to them and said, please, show us your ways. And the Old Ones said, piss off. Not really, they Damn. were a lot more humble about it, but they did not want to share their secret of immortality with the Necrons. The Necrons, of course, took this very well and waged war with them. Kind of under this <laughs> Of course banner. they did. The Necron different dynasties didn't really like each other. But under this one man, the Silent King, he thought the best way to unite his race was to do this giant war with the Old Ones out of spite for them keeping the secret of immortality to them. This Makes sense. Unite your people against a common enemy was known as the War in Heaven, and this is actually like a multi-stage war, because during this War in Heaven, they discovered the Star Gods, a whole new race of people known as the Catan, or the Catan. These Star Gods were also very much like old ones, almost omnipotent beings, and they too had the key to immortality. And so the Necrons went to them and said, hey, can you help us fight off the old ones can you help us kill these old ones you the katan and the katan said yes and in fact we can help provide you with the immortality you so desperately seek so the silent Ooh. king of the necrons decided to make a pact with the katan to allow them to accept this generous gift of immortality upon them but this but? of course had been a horrendous trap and the Necrons were dragged in chains to this biotransference where their flesh was stripped from them, replaced with nothing but a metal hollow shell as their souls were ripped from their body and fed to the Catan. And the Catan fattened up. They got chonk on the souls of the Necrons. As this was their plan all along, they consumed the flesh and souls of the Necron tier and turned them all into unwilling robotic slaves just to serve their will. And then with their uh. newfounded Necron army, they pointed their guns at the old ones and the Catan continued their domination of the stars and their genocide complete and full genocide of these old ones. The old ones did their best to stave it off. They even created other races, the Eldari and the Orcs, to try to fight off the horrifying Necron army and the Catan above them. But there was absolutely no possible chance for them. And the old ones were absolutely extinguished across the galaxy. Their entire race completely removed. Full on 100% genocide. However, during all this, the Catan so just infatuated with their victory started fighting each other for fun for sport and for of small course. differences doesn't matter as you do the katan with these over overpowered people they're going to eventually hit each other at some point and yeah. as they began just menially fighting each other the eldari and the orcs actually started pushing on the katan's borders a little bit giving them a Ooh. little bit of a run for their money and as this continued this is when the silent king who retained his consciousness <gasps> decided to leap into action and start a full scale revolt against oh, the heck yeah, dude. masters and this revolt was bloody as the entire necron army was surged off to destroy these star gods they were able to just after suffering horrendous losses were able to turn the tide of the war and they took these Katan and they blasted them. 
Because as these star gods are unkillable, they were able to break them into thousands of shards and entrap them in giant stasis vaults to now actually be uh. slaves to the Necrons. And with the Necrons oh, having well. the entirety of their old gods enslaved the to tables them, have turned. they realized that soon their race was about to be attacked by the overcoming new races, the Eldari and the Krorks. And so what they did is they retreated into giant stasis tombs in order to preserve their energy and their strength for when one day they would be reawakened and they would be able to rule the galaxy that was rightfully theirs and then some dingus adeptus mechanicus guy diddles <laughs> with a green console and now the necrons are back and they see all these primitive races on their lawns and they think get the fuck off of <laughs> the necrons are back super advanced and they are here to reclaim the galaxy that they so rightfully believe is theirs i actually like really love their story apparently they didn't have it before but i'm, I'm so glad that it was more fleshed out now that tabletop they're a lot like that tons of undead egyptian skeleton robots that when they die they just get right back up because they keep on reanimating hard to kill tons of crazy stuff you can use the katan themselves as units to fight with it's pretty cool the Necrons are the, one of the three major events in 40k. The Horus Heresy, the Fall of the Eldar, and the Awakening of the Necrons are all pretty substantial events. I see. And the Necrons themselves are pretty, pretty dang cool as well. Here's a good quote from a wonderful Dawn of War game. Lucky creatures, as long last you have found the tranquility of death. I was like you once, clinging to life and blind to the truth. When I uncovered the truth, I too shuddered and pale with fear. Deep in these catacombs, I was remade. Here, my brethren slumbered for eons while the living grew like weed. My lord knew this day would come. He had plans for us all. We would purge this world once more. So come, poor victims of life. We will grant you tranquility in these crypts. Kronos will be a tomb world once more. Necrons are also pretty smug. Trays in the infinite, especially. A little more dickhead. <laughs> but speaking of dickheads, last race. Let's talk the Tau. Here we go. We the Tau. The exact formation of the Tau Empire is not entirely understood. However, a long, long time ago, many thousands of years ago, uh, in the 40k world that is, some Imperial navigation vessels were going around through different areas, and they saw a primitive race blue people smacking each other with sticks and stones. They thought, eh, dumb Xenos race who gives a shit, and they bailed. Then this giant warp storm gotcha. occurred right in that major area, unable to be breached. Then, once that warp storm 6,000 years later subsided, hello, those little sticks. Well, mm. they decided to actually have no war of any kind and all just unite together under one flag of the Tau Empire. And now they have gigantic starships and Gundam <laughs> robots and lasers and railguns and mechs. And they are here to ruin your day for the greater good. That is generally the Tau Empire. The greater good? Uh, they have this kind of In feeling quotation? of this homogenous group. All species can go underneath the banner of the greater good. The greater good is their idea oh. of a fundamental increase and help of all. In fact, they are most likely the most like the Covenant in Halo, where they have the mm, overarching okay. prophets, being the Ethereals, who are actually kind of dicks and, and like to pull at strings a little bit, but then you have all these different races directly underneath them, and they all work together in this big group as this large, foreboding race that tries to spread their weirdly pseudo-religious influence across the galaxy. The alien is not intrinsically evil. Do not hate him. Pity him, his ignorance. Seek to understand his differences and equate him with his inadequacies. Only then will he accept his place in the greater good. That is generally the Tau. And if you're kind of wondering like what their mainly big shtick is, well, they're all about big robots and mechs. They have laser rifles and cool. rail guns. They got giant mechs with tons of missile pods and heavy rail rifles and rail guns and burst cannons and ion accelerators and void shields and all this stuff. And that is generally what the Tau's all about. But you're probably thinking, Bricky, this doesn't sound that evil. Yeah. This doesn't sound very grim, dark Warhammer. Like, in comparison to all the other factions, so far they seem like the good guys, but obviously there's 
Gotta be a twist here in a second. And you'd be right. The Tao Empire really don't have that much of a horrifying, grim, dark style like everybody else. They're much more younger, new age thing. In mm. fact, they're probably okay. a lot less evil and a lot even better than they are now. No twist. Back in the day, because they liked having like that good guy faction. But a lot of us who really liked the, the dark, depressing style of Warhammer didn't really like it that much. So see, the Tau get a lot of hate and a lot of that hate isn't necessarily unjustified. It's mainly from a tabletop perspective, but as you can see from all the visuals I've shown you recently, they don't really fit in the 40K universe very well. They I see. It's because it's, it's not like grim and dark and whatnot. It's more of just like you put Gundam into the 40k universe. They lack that super dark, dramatic, kind of high gothic level the Imperium has. They mm -hmm. don't have yeah. the weird, kind of like grungy stuff that Chaos or say the Orcs do. And the Necrons and the Eldar have their own specific style as well. Yeah. The Tau really do look like something out of Gundam. And while it isn't necessarily a bad thing, it does definitely not fit too well. There's that. There's also the tabletop problem. Uh, in tabletop, Tau are horrible at melee combat, but exceptionally <laughs> good at ranged combat. So they blast everyone from really, really far away, and they have a million rules to make it so that it's nearly impossible for you to get into melee combat. So it basically mm, just forces you to bottleneck the game into one specific gameplay style, which is gun to gun. And if which, yeah, from a gameplay perspective, not really fun for anybody playing against you. If you're doing gun to gun, they're going to win every time because they're the Tau, and the Tau are really damn good at shooting. So it's one of those things that make the Tau generally rather hated and a lot of different reasons uh, for that, uh, both from style and such. But this is actually one of the things I wanted to end this video with, is that the Tau, while they have their issues, you should not be discouraged from playing them. I'll make plenty of Tao weeaboo jokes, of course I will, but it's all generally in good fun. Anyone who legitimately doesn't want you to play a faction is an idiot and you shouldn't be giving them the time of day. You pick True. what you think is cool and what you like. In Warhammer especially now, factions get better and they get worse, they grow and then they fall. You should only be playing what you think is cool. You like the look, you like the mm -hmm. models. If you're talking tabletop, so that many is what you cool be looking factions every too. Every time is what you think is badass because things change all the time. But the universe of Warhammer has so much going for it. Every faction has something interesting, every character has a story, and there's a million stories to be told. The universe is vast and exciting, and while it is dark, depressing, and horrible, that is the damn charm. And and out of everything I've told you in these two videos, is there anything you could take away is the reason why so many of us are so into this series and why we like it so much. Because with so much variety, such an expansive universe, and so much that can be done, you can find yourself having a pretty great time. He who scoffs <laughs> at the power of the last gun has never ran through a field of a thousand <laughs> of them. Bye -bye. I love it. Thank you very much, Pricky. Of course, if you haven't, I'm sh assuming that all of you guys who are watching this already have, but if you haven't, uh, please go and leave a like on his video and go and support him if you can. Not gonna lie, ever since I saw the Grey Knights, I didn't think there would be any other faction that I would, you know, kind of gel with. <laughs> God, the orcs are, <laughs> they look really fun to play. Uh, I mean, if any of you guys are, are play orcs, uh, please let me know what your experience is like, because uh, I'm kind of interested. There's a lot of things that I like about how all the different factions are, where, whether it's their design or where they're positioned in the world and what their ideals are, the reason for being and the reason for doing things, which was all clearly kind of thought out uh, in order to give you sort of a I, you a reason to play for their factions, right? Like, even the super evil gods that are literally beings of chaos have something good about them. Or rather, in the Warhammer 40k universe, you kind of have to throw out the concept of good and evil. There isn't really anything that's black and white. All there really is is war and survival of the fittest. Even the Dark Eldar, who do these horrible, horror things that literally nobody should ever experience in their life are doing it for survival, which I can understand, but I can't really get behind. <laughs> With a playground this huge, 
I can only imagine the different like stories and games that you can make out of just taking a bunch of different combinations of factions and seeing how they would mix with each other. Like finding unlikely allies in other factions or being backstabbed by your own, which I'm sure happens quite a lot in these kind of stories. To me, it's just also incredibly fun to imagine the possibilities. And during the video, Bricky also elaborated on certain major events that happened within the Warhammer 40k universe, so uh, I was quite enthralled by a lot of them. I, I really like the Necron story, as well as the Eldar story, and it makes me just want to know more about like how the timeline works out and what major events are, are canon and how they kind of shape the way that factions are. So maybe I'll check them out when I can. But of course, if you guys have any recommendations for me to look at, please leave them in the comments below. I literally know nothing about the Warhammer universe, I just know that I've seen reaction videos of Bricky's faction videos, which is why I, I did this initially in the first place. So yeah, wherever you guys lead me, I will try and see if I'm interested. But of course, thank you guys so much for watching, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you in the next one.